This episode of The Catholic Current is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Thank you for listening. We had heroes and we had some devils. <laughs> this is actually taking the sacrificial love as Christians understanding and turning it into a kind of mockery. I inspire a lot of awkward silences, but that that's another topic so for did another Jesus. Time. <laughs> We've been pecked to death. One little case here, one little case there. And you wake up and you go, we didn't really fight aggressively enough. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current. We bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, that we might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, we have a challenging question today. The question is this. When does human life begin? Something uh, even more profound and perhaps even more unnerving than when your young son or daughter says, you know, Mommy, Daddy, where where did I, I come from? This is a, a matter of science, a matter of faith, a matter of philosophy and theology, and sometimes even a matter of law. Our guest today is an author and a scholar. He's the co-founder of the Donum Vita Institute. He's married uh, with 11 children, three of whom are in heaven. Francis Etheridge, welcome to The Catholic Current. Thank you. Uh, you know, Francis, I, as someone who's uh, taught um, philosophical anthropology, someone who's taught medical ethics, uh, and someone who's been advocating for the culture of life for, gosh, 30 years now, uh, I was amazed by, by your book called Conception, an Icon of the Beginning. We'll be linking to that to our, our, our resources after the broadcast today. Uh, it's an amazingly thorough interdisciplinary book uh, dealing with when human life begins. There seems to have been a time when the answer to that question was obvious. Why is it a controversial question now? Well, it was obvious always, in a sense, because each one of us witnesses to the fact we had a beginning. There is something simple about looking at the other person, looking Mm -hmm. at ourselves, looking at our family history. There is a sense in which there is a simplicity about the fact that we exist this, and therefore we have a beginning. Right. And, you you know... The controversy has arisen because people had ulterior motives. Right. Why, for example, do people want to promote the idea that there is a delayed animation? Well, on the one hand, you have the philosophical dispute. Is there a first instance of a beginning, or is there a delayed animation? But on the other hand, you have the overlay of the fact that there are companies, biological, technological companies, which want to exploit the very early existence of the human being. And therefore, this controversy has, in a way, been taken up and commercialized. It's no longer just a scholarly question. Right. Right. I, I think what we're dealing with is not, you know, recent uh, profound uh, discoveries into the non-humanity of the unborn child, courtesy of the sciences or, or philosophy or, or, or theology. What we have here are commercial opportunities, uh, the selling of abortion, the selling of contraception, which is often abortifacient, and, and the, the selling of, uh, of fetal tissues. We also have the cultural phenomenon of the convenience of uh, selling the illusion that one can buy uh, surgery or chemistry becomes somehow mysteriously unpregnant. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, on a scientific level, on a moral level, on a spiritual level, one can become post-pregnant, but, but never unpregnant. So in raising the question, where did I come from? When do, does human life begin? Uh, is it the case that you and your colleagues in this amazing interdisciplinary book on, on conception are trying to say, stop believing the lies? Look more carefully. Is that what you had in mind when you put the book together? 
the book follows the fact that we all have a, a point of discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the points of discovery for me was in the church's philosophical thinking. She said there is no philosophical position on the first instant of conception. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to be a marvelous way of discovering uh, that there is a real question here. And then mm -hmm. the way it unfolds in many directions. It right. unfolds in the fact that the church herself has a recognition that a question can be open, nevertheless, she can protect human life from the beginning. But right. at the same time, she can be open to the fact that there are different aspects to this question. Mm -hmm. So, in Scripture, for example, you have this wonderful expression of Eve, I have gotten a child with the help of God. Right. Really, implicitly in that is a wonderful realization of, on the one hand, the understatement of the contribution of herself and Adam, yes. and on the other hand, this perceptive recognition that there was in the existence of the child within her an act beyond herself, an act beyond her husband, an act beyond their coming together. Yes. And so between the church's recognition of there being an open philosophical question and the source of scripture, on the other hand, then you also have the, the modern embryological evidence. Yes. And that, for example, uh, turns on quite extraordinary images, I admit, but nevertheless, perceptions which are along the lines that when you have an inert ovum, on the one hand, mm -hmm. an ovum in which the mitochondria, the energy set components of the cell, aren't active, and then on the other hand, you have an active sperm, and then suddenly, together, at the point of their contact, you have the most amazing beginning of activity, and the ovum ceases to be an ovum in the very instant of their contact, whereby the pores that have allowed a sperm to enter this rather remarkable ovum then close. And this hmm. is the first instance. It is a, an outward sign, you could say, right. of an inward act. And if there was ever a natural sacrament, it seems to me that is it. Yes. Because within that moment, you have an external change, and therefore the very possibility of God bringing to exist the whole human person. Yeah. Uh, friends, we are talking with scholar and author Francis Etheridge. We're talking about when does human life begin. Uh, Francis, I, I think that language is so very important in these matters. When you made the scriptural reference to, to Adam and Eve, and, and obviously the, the sovereign work of God and all this, and that's why the, the language of procreation, I think, is more accurate and therefore morally superior to the, the language of reproduction. Uh, you know, when I think of reproduction, I, I think of, of copy machines. Uh, I, I think of, of tools. You know, I think of cars coming off of, of a factory line. It's a process that we can control, and when we can control it, we're also concerned about quality control, especially when people pay for it. I, I don't know about life in, in the UK, but, but in the United States, you can order a, a child uh, according to your specifications, uh, through you know uh, through the arrangement of uh, gamete donors who never meet, and you can uh, arrange to have a, a surrogate mother as a birth mother with the understanding that if abnormalities are detected, the birth mother must abort, or uh, the uh, birth mother becomes responsible for the child because we're paying money for a good product. Damn it. And if things turn out to be a disappointment, we're just going to hit the hard reset button. So I, I think that. Uh, paying attention to, to the language and paying attention to the imagery is is so uh, is so important. And I think it's wonderful now when, when uh, women go for their first sonogram and they send the photographs up on their, their their social media and they put the photographs on on the refrigerators and so on. Uh, that's an indication that uh, you're you're going to be hard pressed to argue against the humanity of the unborn child. And yet there's still stubborn resistance to the, both the obvious and the beautiful. Why is that? Well, I think as you refer to the mothers who put the picture on the refrigerator, 
perhaps what they have retained, what they are open to, is the surprise, mm-hmm. the wonder, the extraordinary sense of, as Eve said, I have been given a gift. And this is very much in the theology of St. John Paul II, that we live, or we are rediscovering in this time, a theology of gift. I mean, in the background, you could say, there is the gift of creation. Now, as it says in Gaudium et Spares, if you lose the sense of the creator, if you lose the sense of God, life becomes unintelligible. Well, to come at it from a different action, if you perhaps haven't a sense of God, but nevertheless you have a sense of openness to what is happening to you, like the mother who puts her picture on the fridge, she is seeing something with this open eye, with this open heart. Now perhaps it's also to do with being able to wonder, being able to ponder like Mary does, Mm. being able to be with a contemplative gaze. Because there's nothing analytical, is there? No, no, very good. Friends, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with author and scholar Francis Etheridge. He's married with uh, 11 children, three of whom are in heaven. He's co-founder of the Donum Vena Institute. We're talking about where uh, does, when does human life begin. In the next segment, we're going to talk about the human person as a window into the divine. You don't want to miss that. We've started another important conversation here at the Catholic Current, and remember our rallying cry, Christus Mundo, Mundus Christo, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. We do it because God our Lord says so. We do it for the greater glory of God, the good of our neighbor, and the salvation of our soul. After the broadcast, go to thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio podcast. Let's keep the conversation going. We'll be back in just two minutes. Stay with us. The Station of the Cross brings you Mother Miriam Live each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern. As far as the Mass is concerned, the Church has the rubrics of the Mass. They have not changed. They have not changed, and they must be followed. Listen on your local Station of the Cross affiliate or on our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. You can also watch the Mother Miriam Live video stream every day on Facebook at the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio. Has a review ever helped you decide if you'll download a particular app or not? Help others decide on our apps. If you appreciate our iCatholic Radio and iCatholic Music mobile apps, please rate and review. From the app menu, just touch Rate Our App. If you don't have our apps yet, they're available for Android and Apple mobile devices. Thank you for considering leaving a rating and review for iCatholic Radio and iCatholic Music. Thank you for listening to The Catholic Current on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Each morning, The Catholic Current sends out a short survey on the topic for today's show so that you can share your thoughts and any questions you might have. This is a great way to participate, especially if you aren't able to call in live. A few of the responses will be read over the air to add to the discussion, so make sure you sign up to receive our emailed survey at thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current. We bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our serious topic today is this, when does human life begin? Our guest is Francis Etheridge, a scholar and author. He's co-founder of the Donum Vitae Institute. We're talking about two of his books, which we'll, we'll certainly link to in the resources after the broadcast. One is called Conception, an Icon of the Beginning, and the other is called uh, the, the Prayerful Kiss. In this segment, Francis, I want to talk about the human person as a window into the divine. And you, you, there's a quote there from one of your colleagues in the book on Conception. quotes Pope St. Gregory the Great, and the Pope says this, What scripture is for the man who knows how to read, the icon is for the illiterate. Through it, even uneducated men can see what they must follow. It is the book of those who do not know the alphabet. So says Pope St. Gregory. I was fascinated by that, and I want to take up the thread of the conversation from the last segment, that what we're talking about isn't simply or merely analytical. It's not a matter of adding up numbers 
or parsing words. There's a capacity for for seeing with the eye and also for seeing with the heart. There's something intuitive about seeing human life as precious from the very beginning. And in a certain sense, our culture has to work very hard to uh, distract us from that fact and, and, and teach us lies. In your book, you, you, you uh, and your colleagues speak at length about um, the unborn child and the human person as a window or icon of the divine. Tell us more about that, please. Well, it's a case of pondering. Again, going back to Mary, mm-hmm. we have in front of us, um, on the one hand, creation, Mm-hmm. and this amazing act which brings it to exist from nothing. And on the and then there are implications in that. But if it comes from nothing, it comes gratuitously. It comes as a gift. And then if you ponder also the beginning of human life, you're pondering also the fact that we don't have a right to a child. Right. We understand very well the suffering of infertility, the death of the child, all the problems that can arise in terms of illness and disease. Right. But what we have in front of us is a pondering of how a child even can come to exist. We know the embryological structure of the coming together of the ovum and the sperm. But nevertheless, we know also this insufficiency that is within there. And therefore, you have this pondering on the act of God that brings right. this to exist. And this gives us a kind of dialogue between God as creator and God as the creator of each one of us. And this pondering then also includes the mystery of the Blessed Trinity, because as John Paul II says in his letter to families, when God created, he as it were paused and considered the divine we. So there is an amazing sense which we come out of, we come into existence out of the interrelationships of the Blessed Trinity, but then we also come into existence in relationship to each other. There's a kind of individualism in a sense, both within philosophy and perhaps within our culture, which Mm -hmm. makes us look at ourselves as if I am solely an I. But in fact, when you think about it, the husband and the wife come together with Mm -hmm. the mystery of the action of God, but mm-hmm. each one expresses a relationship. So no sooner do we exist than we exist in relationship. So in that sense, you could say, there is this incredible rebounding, as it were, between the mystery of God as the Blessed Trinity and the mystery of us coming to exist in the midst of many relationships. Because not only is a child a, ch- a son or daughter, their parents, their a grandchild, a granddaughter. We come into the midst of an amazing number of relationships. So is this not a resounding echo of the mystery of the Blessed Trinity? Right. I, I agree with you that, there, that one of the sicknesses of, of modernism is that we are isolated individuals and we're, we're self-created through our choices and uh, we find ourselves thrown into existence, as Heidegger would say. You know, we're, we're living in, in the law of the jungle. Uh, no one has a claim upon us and no one has, uh, and no one has any uh, natural or supernatural bonds. And those kinds of isolated individuals are, are ripe for both commercial and cultural and even spiritual exploitation as well. And one of the things I, I like about your, your book on conception is it uses a, a variety of disciplines to say absolutely not that uh, such approaches are, are dehumanizing. They're not ennobling. And I think that uh, you know, if we have a proper sense of the role of God in the creation of the human person, then we begin to see human life as, as a gift, uh, and a gift to be cherished as we ourselves were, were meant to be cherished. And yet, you know, you and I would be denounced as, uh, as haters or, or anti-women or even anti-science, which I think is especially uh, ironic. How did, we, how did we get here? How did we, we, we get to the point where we have to scramble for the, the, the worthiness of what is obviously human life? Well, I can think, for example, 
of the ancient philosophy that considered the human person as, on the one hand, form, and on the other, matter. Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of impersonalism in the history of philosophical thinking. Mm -hmm. And possibly one of the great gifts of the Christian development out of the Jewish tradition is recognizing that actually there is a whole here. You know, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them in his image and likeness. There is a whole different language to just some kind of solitary philosophical substance. Now, while there is an adequate starting point, as it were, one of the things about this philosophical tradition is matter always existed, and somehow form took it to be a specific thing, whether it was a plant or an animal Mm -hmm. or a human being. Now, one of the characteristics, if you like, of the account of Genesis is there is a beginning. And if there is a beginning, there is a wholeness to the act of creativity, something which we need to recover. Now, probably one of the problems that arises is if you have an evolutionary account of the human being, along with creation itself, One of the problems that arises is how do you understand, if you like, the point of development from plant to animal, from animal to human being? Right. In a way, it devalues the nature of the body. Whereas if if you take a view that actually, if I as an artist create a picture, Mm. I am creating something as a whole, then you can see that actually the body is an intimate expression of the person. You know, right. If I, as a man, am made, as John Paul would say, to make of myself a gift, what better expression is, is it, that there is another person who is different and complementary, both capable of giving the gift of themselves, but also of receiving my own gift? Right. So you have then this language of gift, which really goes beyond philosophical ideas in a new way. And, and it's... Make- it's beyond the, the reach of mere transaction, and it, it's beyond the reach of, of mere uh, negotiation. And inevitably, we, we allied into uh, matters of covenant. Friends, we're talking about when does human life begin with scholar and author Francis Etheridge. He's co-founder of the Donum Vitae Institute. I found w- one of the statements in, in your book to, to be absolutely uh, pivotal. You write, where the body lives, there is the soul, and where both are there is the person. Tell us more about that, please. Well, in the language of the church, you had the taking up of the concept of person from the Greek background. And as the church pondered this word person, so she began to see that person is, in a sense, one in relation to another. So you had... St. Augustine's incredible expression of a person is a subsistent relation. The Mm -hmm. father is in relation to the son. The father and the son are in relation to the Holy Spirit. So you have a sense implicit within the philosophical and theological tradition of the church of us being, or of God, being in relationship. Now, when it comes then to defining what we are as individuals. One of the things that John Paul II did, he he took up this tradition, and particularly a Thomistic tradition, and he looked very critically at the fact that it wasn't being developed in terms of the human being. Mm -hmm. And so, being somewhat saturated in his work, I began to see that he is pulling out the relational nature of the fact that in being made in the image and likeness of God, we are being more fruitfully in relationship to each other than perhaps we realize that the very concept of person that we end up with is not just something, as it were, individualistic, but it is something which embeds us in relationships. 
just as you can say that on the one hand, God is one, and on the other is the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. So the very concept of person that we use so frequently and so commonly is utterly rich and enriched by this tradition of expressing relationships. So when we take the terms of soul and body, they really need to be recovered in a way which shows how fully they are expressing not just an entity on its own, but the fact that we are almost inescapably made for communion. Yes. That our happiness cannot but exist in terms of our relationships to others because it is so mon- fundamental a part of us. Fact, yeah, but that's what we've we seen you know, in Genesis, uh, the idea that you know, it is not good for, for the man to, to be alone. Our, our body mm-hmm. and soul together uh, make us cry out for relationship, and our body and soul together help us to find one another. And, and, and that finding, because it, it imitates the relationship of the Trinity, is meant to be fruitful. Friends, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation about when does human life begin. In the next segment, we're going to ask our guest, Francis Etheridge, author and scholar, why, how do we know that human life is worth living? We've started another very important conversation here at the Catholic Current. We want you to keep it going among your family and friends. We need to spread it around the world. And we know that we can do it together, and we cannot do it without you. And we're going to make it easy for you. After the broadcast today, go to thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Everything you need to know to get on top of this topic and to lead a conversation with those you love, we make it available to you. Friends, we'll be back in just two minutes. Stay with us. The Station of the Cross invites you to join us each day for the Liturgy of the Hours at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The Liturgy of the Hours is the daily prayer of the Church and is made up of readings from sacred scripture, writings from saints and theologians, and small reflections. For details about each hour and more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. We hope you'll join us for this daily prayer of the Church each day at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Station of the Cross. In Psalm 34, verse 7, we read, In my misfortune I called. The Lord heard and saved me from all distress. As we see in Scripture, we must approach our Lord in all humility, and the Lord will be there to save us. We must never doubt His help in our time of need. Please remember to pray daily for the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and for all of your fellow listeners. It's important to remember each other in prayer and to lift one another up as members of the body of Christ. We are encouraged to pray for one another, and we can all benefit from these prayers. There are many prayers in which you can remember the Station of the Cross, including the Most Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Divine Office, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, and the Most Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. You can even pray for us during your time in Eucharistic adoration. May God bless you for your faithfulness to our Lord and His Church. Thank you for listening to The Catholic Current on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. If you miss any portion of today's show or want to listen to any past episodes, click the podcast link under the Programs tab at the top of our homepage, thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your early host of the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our complex topic today is this, when does human life begin? Our, ge- our guest is Francis Etheridge. He's married with 11 children, three of whom are in heaven. He's an author and a scholar. He's co-founder of the Donum Vitae Institute, and we're linking 
to two uh, amazing books that he was responsible for. One is called Conception, an Icon of the Beginning, and also The Prayerful Kiss, which is more of a uh, poetic theological reflection on the beginnings of human life. Francis, in this segment, we want to talk about how do we know uh, how that life is worth living, and what does it have to do with uh, our, our human and divine origins? Okay, well, I think we... We don't necessarily assume that we know life is worth living. Mm -hmm. Just as there are, if you like, intellectual starting points to inquiries and investigations, as we previously discussed, different Mm -hmm. understandings of whether the soul is there from the first instant or whether it's delayed. Mm -hmm. Now, there are also personal origins to question. So from my own experience, I can remember growing up and at 14, running away, because oh. already was within me uh, a lack of understanding about my own history. I was unhappy, but I didn't know why I was unhappy. I wasn't mm-hmm. able to talk to my parents. I didn't have friends. I could see others were going out and meeting people. I didn't have interest. In a way, we can start to ask questions about life from our own very histories, which are, in a way... Um, almost the opposite. You know, we start from a point of view of being bored or unhappy or not knowing what's true or what I want to do with my life. We don't necessarily start with knowing that life is worth living. Right. And I think in my experience then of asking these questions, I was very fortunate because I can remember when I tried to commit suicide at around 16, taking some pills and... In that very isolation of nobody knowing what was going on, nobody knowing the, uh, what I was going through, I can nevertheless remember the possibility of, of thinking, well, what if Christ is waiting as a judge and I have trashed this life? And I remember being afraid. And that okay. fear inspired me to drink. And it kept me alive. Thanks and so God. from that point of view, it's, there was something counter to my own unhappiness. There was something counter to the meaninglessness. And it was this possibility of being judged, but not in a way that um, didn't inspire me to carry on living, but rather stopped me from ending, ending my life. Now, having stopped me from ending my life, it then, if you like, put me on a path of questions. Why did I get to this point? How did it happen? And there's a kind of slow asphyxiation but if you really don't know what your suffering is about what what happens it strangles you and Mm. as i moved into this history of my own i discovered that when i suffered the humiliations that i did at school because i was a failure um, Mm. an academic failure and the response of the school i went to was you were beaten with a cane and this humiliation kind of really burned into me and I didn't want to tell anyone. I didn't want to admit that I was hurt, that I was crying, I was suffering. And therefore, it kind of went internal. And in this hiding of myself, I would later recognize actually the existence of pride. Because hmm. to admit to being hurt, to admit to suffering, is humbling. And I wouldn't accept this humility. I wouldn't accept this um, inability of myself to cope with my own life. And so I think that was one of the reasons that my whole life became a kind of um, sore in a way, but a concealed mm-hmm. sore. Right, and therefore right. the unhappiness went within. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it wasn't until I started probing it that even that history came back to me. I remember uh, lying awake on one occasion and just the whole stream of what had happened just coming back to me as if it was a kind of psychological discovery. Right. So questions of the meaning and significance of life can emerge out of the complete opposite. You know, when, why didn't I give up? Well, in one sense, you can say that impulse of life is there, but it right. needed, even at the point of ending it, it needed that fear of the judgment of Christ to help me carry on. I, I want to expand on, on your, and thank you for uh, you know the the clarity of, of your testimony, and, and I'm 
uh, I'm sorry for the, the, the pain of, of, of your suffering. Uh, our, our, when we're in pain, when we're in suffering, uh, that's a reminder that we're, we're vulnerable, that we're woundable, that we're insufficient, that we're incomplete. And I think that can uh, generate different responses. One is despair leading to suicide. One is a kind of rage, uh, a hell-born rage that can lead us to uh, megalomania and that the desire for absolute self-sufficiency. And then the, the third option is to lead us out into relationship. And I'm thinking of a quote from C.S. Lewis. I want to see if I can remember it fully. Uh, C.S. Lewis says, To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will most certainly be wrung and possibly broken. And he goes on to say, I believe, the only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love uh, is is hell. Uh, So if the mania for self-sufficiency, that modernity, uh, can only lead us uh, towards hell, and uh, relationships can and even love can, can be so painful, where is where is the walk of grace and, and and wisdom, where can we find resources to help work with the triumph of love? I think we have to start where we are. And so for me, although I was brought up in a Catholic family, Christianity wasn't the first place I started. Mm-hmm. And I started asking questions about psychological development and why was I unhappy. Mm-hmm. I didn't immediately turn to Christianity. I started mm-hmm. looking at the question of psychological development and then beginning to understand well actually a family inadvertently sometimes transmits its own perfections to its children yes and but then you begin to inquire well why did that happen why does it even exist and then you begin to think well actually it's an insufficient explanation because why does imperfection exist at all mm-hmm. and why is it trans- and so you end up with actually coming to the beginnings of a doctrine of Christianity, namely the existence of original sin. Because right. you see a psychological explanation has a certain insufficiency about it. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it actually leads you, if you follow it through, to something which is more substantial, something which has an origin. And this is the problem otherwise. You never get to anything that has an origin, that has a starting point. Whereas if you actually follow the thread through, it leads you beyond, because you you start to see that um, theories of uh, what families transmit to each other doesn't itself explain why these imperfections exist. And so you end up with the doctrine of original sin. And so you then start to come back from that and think, uh, well, why why did that exist? And you can almost end up in a kind of philosophical maelstrom because you can ask questions until you're endlessly asking questions. Right. And I think that's also part of the angst that I went through because you can go on asking them. And at what point do you say, well, actually, I've got an answer. I've got a stopping point or a starting point. Well, you know, that, that's very that's very important. I mean, as someone who's, you know, studied and taught philosophy for, for decades, eventually you have to come to something that is root, that is immediately graspable, you know, a, a simple apprehension, a first principle, and you either get it or you don't. You either intuit it rightly or not at all. And if you don't intuit it rightly, there's something there's something so gravely amiss that nothing, none of the other pieces of the puzzle can, can fall into place. Friends, we're talking about when does human life begin? Our guest today is Francis Etheridge, author and, and scholar and co-founder of the Donum Vitae Institute. In this segment, we're talking about uh, how do we know that human life is worth living. In the second book of yours that we're talking about today, the first was Conception, an icon of the beginning. Uh, the second one is uh, more theological, more poetic, called uh, the, the Prayerful Kiss. Uh, you talk about uh, the human person being an icon of the Trinity. And that makes me wonder, how can an icon of the Trinity, someone made to be uh, a window into the divine, how can such a being ever be lonely? I accept what you say about the icon of the Trinity, but we also know uh, bitterly uh, from firsthand experience the, the reality of, of loneliness. What's, how, do, how do we account for the gap between the two? Is that also a function of original sin? Oh, in terms of the society in which we live, Daddy Metzbears has said quite clearly that if God ceases to be understandable or even 
for us to believe he exists, then we ourselves become unintelligible to ourselves. And if we become unintelligible, isn't that a sense in which we are entering an existential loneliness? Because actually, as we've been discussing throughout this program, it is the, the Blessed Trinity that helps us to understand ourselves as being in relation to others, and that everything we do communicates with, explicitly or implicitly. So I think in terms of this dialogue, if we have rejected the possibility of communicating with God, we have, in a sense, alienated ourselves from one of the deepest roots of our being, if not the deepest root. But having said that, God doesn't abandon us, and therefore there is an opportunity for God to, as it were, visit and revisit, seeking to establish this dialogue with us. Well, it, it's reminiscent of uh, Francis Thomas' poem, uh, the, the Hound of Heaven, uh, that, that God is, is not content to leave us to our own devices, and that while we breathe, there is still hope. And I think that one of the consequences of our origin is that if we uh, withhold ourselves from the divine, we don't free ourselves, we denature ourselves, we dehumanize ourselves. And, and that's uh, that sets us up for catastrophic loss, it sets us up for, for chaos, and really it prepares us uh, for hell. So I, I think that uh, human nature in this world, uh, in the circumstances that we find ourselves in, is uh, such that uh, we're always on, on the precipice. We're on the precipice of choosing for the divine, which makes us fully human, or choosing against the divine, which makes us other than human, which makes us less than human, which denatures ourselves. And the irony of the world that we find ourselves in now is that we are not able to see clearly what those choices are, what the consequences are, and the resources that Holy Mother Church offers to us to help us to make our choice well. I certainly think there is lots to recover here because, yes. for example, have we fully appreciated the presence of Christ in the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Yes. I mean, I can remember returning to the church and in a way being like um, a revolving door. You sort of go in and come out and confess your sins, go to the sacraments. But then I think there is something more required. I think the nature of faith is about establishing a relationship which actually changes us. I mean, this revolving door experience went on for many years and suffering drove me through it, if you like. But it wasn't until I encountered one of the new movements called the Neocatechumenal Way when I was challenged with the fact of, do I have faith? Yes. And this originally made me angry and I thought, well, do I have faith? But actually it was one of the questions that had arisen because of a lot of failed relationships. I've been unable to marry. I'd get close to it and I couldn't bring myself to do it. It was like trying to go through a barbed gate. I couldn't do it. And, and, and clearly now you're, you're married, you're the father of, of, of 11 children. God has brought a victory uh, to you. Francis Etheridge, thank you for being a fine guest. I hope we can have you on the air again soon. I'm Father Robert McKay of the Society of Jesus, your host here of the Catholic Current. After, after the broadcast today, go to the station of the cross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcasts, or on most major platforms, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, Apple Podcasts, you name it. And we will go into uh, the next segment with a reflection that I will offer on how it is possible for beings of divine origin like ourselves to be lonely. You don't want to miss that. There is hope if you are suffering. We'll be back in just two minutes. Stay with us. Tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern for Sermons for Everyday Living. There's no better way to start your day than with spiritual formation from inspiring priests as they preach the gospel in the midst of your busy life. For details about upcoming episodes and for podcasts of past shows, visit thestationofthecross.com and click on Sermons for Everyday Living under the Programs tab. That's Sermons for Everyday Living, weekdays, 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern, on the Station of the Cross. 
Are you interested in learning more about the Catholic Church and the Divine Mercy Devotion? The Catholic Current and Divine Mercy in My Soul episodes are available for download at thestationofthecross.com and through instant streaming on our free iCatholic Radio app. That's thestationofthecross.com or on iCatholic Radio. You're listening to The Catholic Current on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Shortly after today's show, visit our page for The Catholic Current at thestationofthecross.com. Here you'll find a link to Father McTague's recommended reading list and a link for downloading the program so that you can share it with your family and friends. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current. We bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our difficult topic today is this, when does human life begin? Our guest has been Francis Etheridge. He is an author and scholar and co-founder of the Donum Vitae Institute. From the top of the hour, we talked about when human life begins from the perspective Perspective of science, philosophy, uh, theology, the, the arts, and much to my surprise, the conversation took a, an unexpected turn, and that's what I want to address in this segment, and it's about loneliness. There, there seems to be a, an academic of loneliness. In 2018, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom uh, set up a Department of Loneliness and a, a Minister of, of Loneliness to deal with, with the outbreak of human loneliness. And I, I know in Japan, where they're selling more adult diapers than infant diapers, they're rushing uh, onto the market robots who can be daytime companions and even caregivers for the elderly. There seems to be an outbreak of loneliness and along that, I think an increase in uh, extreme addictions and even in suicide. So what are we to make of this, especially in light of what Francis Ether and I, and I talked about from the top of the hour, that human beings are made from the absolute, infinite, perfect generosity of the supreme being, God Almighty. And he has endowed human life, body and soul, with a reflection of himself that he tells a story about himself and his wisdom and making us as male or female. And by the way, it's God who does that, and you don't get to change it. God does that. He also tells a story about himself in giving us intelligence and in giving us freedom and making us moral. So we're made from generosity, and because he's absolutely generous, God chooses to offer and can really only choose to offer to us what is best for us, what will complete us and what will perfect us. And what will complete us and perfect us is himself. So we are made from generosity and we are made for glory. And in our body and our soul, we are made for communion. We are made for community. Understanding the human soul and understanding human bodies and how they fit together we see that God has made us as human, as body and soul, as individuals, as male and female, for community, for union, and for joy. And so we are meant to reflect in our individual lives, our marital lives, our communal lives. We are meant to reflect the life of the Trinity and then to unite with that community of life and love in the next forever. What is your life like if you know that? What is your life like if you feel that, if you love it and you live it? Odds are you're not a compulsive consumer. Odds are that you're not addicted to pornography or promiscuity. And odds are you're not inclined to use people and to love things. And yet, and yet, we've got the uh, the Department of Loneliness in the United Kingdom and um, an outbreak of, of extreme addiction unto death in the United States and the rise of suicide. How do we account for the mess that we're in? Uh, a blogger I like to follow is named Dean Abbott. He says this, and I quote, The ceaseless task of the modern man is to disguise how lonely, scared, and confused he is among all his trinkets. So says Dean Abbott. I think that's brilliant. I think that's insightful. 
the modern world tells us that whoever dies with the most toys wins, and that the more we pursue consumption and acquisition and pleasures, that's what really real life is all about. It's about grasping and consumption. Of course, we know it doesn't work. And one of the, among the proofs that it doesn't work is addiction, is compulsion, is frenetic consumption, to use the phrase of our frequent guest, John Horvat. So we end up with more and more desperate excuses and elaborate theories to explain away our loneliness because, I believe, we can't admit who we are and whose we are. But why not? Why not? Well, let's turn to C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says this, and I quote, The demand of the loveless and the self-imprisoned that they should be allowed to blackmail the universe, that till they consent to be happy on their own terms, no one else shall taste joy, that theirs should be the final power, that hell should be able to veto heaven. So says C.S. Lewis. Right? We are imposing misery on one another, and we are imposing misery on ourselves. And still the question is, why? Well, again, we turn to C.S. Lewis. He says, if we accept heaven, we shall not be able to retain even the smallest and most intimate souvenirs of hell. So says C.S. Lewis. And that's it. That is it. The desire to retain a small souvenir from hell. That's the root of our problem. See, at the root of a culture that facilitates loneliness and isolation and desperation and despair, at that root is an idolatry. An idolatry that loves its sin. An idolatry that says, my will be done. It's a rejection of freedom. Because God Almighty says, you must be free from all that holds you back. You must be free from all that will make you unworthy of glory. You must be free from anything and anyone that is unworthy of your human dignity, which is rooted in divine dignity. So that we can be free for, free for perfection, for glory, for joy, for glimpses of genuine happiness and even ecstasy in this life, even in the midst of suffering. The martyrs teach us that. But ultimately for the happiness of heaven. I ask you to meditate on the Feast of the Assumption and the coronation of Our Lady in the Fifth uh, Glorious Mystery for what human life is supposed to look like when you fully cooperate with God. And what are we to do? We disciples of Christ, we members of the body of Christ who constitute the Bride of Christ, the one church Christ our Lord founded. We must proclaim Him. We must proclaim our Lord that we are consecrated for resurrection, we are destined for glory, and apart from the life of grace, we have no hope. And we must not only tell that truth, we must live our lives in such a way that people will become fascinated and say, what got into Him? Can we get some of that too? And then we can turn to a broken world and say, no, 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 we're only the messenger. We're not the message. We're only the instrument, and we're not the healer. We have to point to Christ. Like St. Philip the Apostle, when the Greeks, the philosophers, wanted to see Jesus, Philip brought them to Jesus, and then he got out of the way. We have to do that too. We have to go on search and rescue. We have to evangelize. We have to be instruments of healing and compassion. And then we must point away from ourselves and say, He must increase and I must decrease. That is the only way forward. That is the way that we can be liberated from the terrible scourge of loneliness. It is our human origin that points to our human destiny, and Christ is the link between the two. I'm Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your host Monday through Friday, 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern here at the Catholic Current. Listen to us at the stationofthecross.com and the iCatholic Radio app. After the broadcast today, go to the stationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. After our broadcast today, uh, after our broadcast, 
mark your calendar for tomorrow. We're going to welcome Dr. Chad Pecknold, and we're going to ask him, why don't uh, people believe in the real presence, especially American Catholics? You don't want to miss that. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace, and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Catholic Current, brought to you by the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is a listener-funded, non-profit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please consider making a donation. Donations can be made through our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling 1-877-888-6279. You can also donate through our free mobile app, iCatholic Radio. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity.